Hello, everybody. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Dr. Robin Reed. I am a pediatric pathologist at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, I know um, some of you, including Andy, uh, from having trained here, but uh, I was away for a number of years and came back about two years ago. Um, I will be presenting uh, three cases today of pediatric renal biopsies with my colleagues in pediatric nephrology here at Seattle Children's Hospital, um, Drs. Uh, Shaina Menon, uh, Jordan Simons, and Raj Munchi. We are very pleased to be invited. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm going to run the presentation off of my computer, but my colleague, Dr. Menon, is going to go first. Um, is that projecting in the correct format? Yes, looks great. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, this is our disclosure slide. We're not going to try and slide anything today. All right, Shaina, take it away. Great. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, our first case today is a 13 year old girl with a recent kidney transplant, rising creatinine, and gross hematuria. So uh, to give some past history, uh, this is a 13-year-old uh, girl who has uh, end-stage kidney disease from IgA nephropathy. She had been on uh, peritoneal dialysis since October 2020 and had a deceased donor kidney transplant in May 2021. She received thymo and methylpred for her induction, and her maintenance immunosuppression was tacro, MMF, and prednisone. Next slide. In terms of her past medical history, uh, she presented in April 2020, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when she was 12 years old with gross hematuria. Uh, was no, uh, gross hematuria was going on for about a month before she came to us, had proteinuria at presentation, creatinine was 1.15. Uh, she uh, uh, pres was treated with... Let's go to the next slide, Robin. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, she, uh, when she presented, we did a kidney biopsy uh, for <laughs> her, and uh, Robin can discuss the biopsy for her. Yeah, so this is her diagnostic biopsy. Um, I'm going to start every um, biopsy discussion by showing you a low magnification trichrome image just to give an overview of what the parenchyma looks like. In this case, you get a sense that this cortex has a lot of interstitial inflammation and probably some interstitial edema, but not a lot of chronic injury. Um, looking more closely, uh, the main finding in this biopsy was extensive crescentic glomerulonephritis with um, numerous cellular crescents. And you can see some of those here in this Jones stain. Um, and here's another image showing, again, a cellular crescent. Um, overall, 90% of the glomeruli were involved by crescents, the great majority of which were cellular, but we did find an occasional fibrocellular or fibrous crescent. Immunofluorescence in this case um, was notable for some um, IgA and C3 dominant staining. The C3 was actually brighter. You can see that the pattern is similar between the two um, and that there was, there was some fainter IgG and IgM staining. No C1Q, no C4. And you can see that the staining pattern is predominantly mesangial, although you can pick up occasional capillary loop staining. Unfortunately, our electron microscopy in this case did not have any glomeruli, so we weren't able to do EM. So the final diagnosis in this case was IgA nephropathy with extensive crescents, but it took a little bit of head scratching because that bright C3 staining um, led us to consider a diagnosis of C3 glomerulopathy, but the IgA was pretty strong, so it didn't seem, it, although it was bright C3, there was also bright IgA. Um, and uh, the other diagnosis that uh, the cyanopathologist considered was lupus. Uh, the patient did have a positive ANA at presentation, but with very minimal IgG staining and with negative C1Q and C4, that seemed less likely. So she came away from this with a diagnosis of IgA nephropathy with crescents. So based on this uh, biopsy, uh, she was started on uh, cyclophosphamide uh, IV pulses with uh, initially pulse methyl uh, prednisolone. She got uh, uh, monthly pulses times four. Uh, and this graph here shows you this uh, is the, her creatinine. So her creatinine at presentation was 1.15. And it gradually kept going up. And around the time, uh, uh, around July, she had a creatinine of uh, 2.6. So we decided to do a second biopsy for her. She had just received her fourth uh, dose of cyclophosphamide at that time. So in the uh, second biopsy, you can see, again, in this scanning uh, magnification image, that there was continued um, interstitial inflammation. And now you get a sense for a little bit more chronicity in this, uh, in this uh, kidney. 
So for example, in this glomerulus here, and I will show you close-ups of this, um, there appears to be some segmental sclerosis. Um, there continued to be crescents. Um, so you can see some cellular crescents in this image. Um, and, and there were also um, some fibrous and fibrocellular crescents. And the other thing that was really striking in this biopsy was um, a fair bit of global glomerular sclerosis. So there were about 40% crescents in this biopsy, but that number is down partly because there were a lot of globally sclerotic glomeruli. Um, and additionally, um, about a third of the glomeruli were now involved by segmental sclerosis or fibrosis. So it looked as though the, um, the disease had progressed to a more chronic state. Uh, we did immunofluorescence on this. I wasn't able to find the images, unfortunately, but the immunofluorescence pattern was rather similar to um, presentation. Um, this time, IgA and, um, and C3 were sort of co-dominant at three plus staining. Um, there was brighter IgG, but still no C1Q and no C4. And the staining was all described as granular um, mesangial and capillary loop staining. Unfortunately, once again, um, our electron microscopy was not successful in this case. In this case, all the glomeruli were globally sclerotic. So this second native biopsy uh, was called IgA nephropathy with extensive crescents and segmental and global glomerular sclerosis. So after this, we uh, stopped her uh, cyclophosphamide. We uh, transitioned her to uh, azathioprine, but she fairly rapidly progressed from that point uh, onwards. And uh, by uh, uh, October uh, of 2020, she uh, was uh, started on peritoneal dialysis. And she remained on dialysis until May 2021, uh, when she received a, a disease donor kidney transplant. And um, induction, as I said, was thymoglobulin and methylpred, followed by tacro prednisone. She did fairly well post-transplant, uh, had some hypertension, um, had a couple of medication changes, was on lisinopril, metoprolol. And then at six weeks post-transplant, uh, she was noted to have proteinuria. Her uh, baseline urine protein tendon, which had always been less than 0.2 post-transplant, went up to one, uh, so she had a biopsy done. So this is how her uh, uh, post-transplant course was. She had been doing well with a creatinine stable and uh, proteinuria started rising, so we decided to do the biopsy. Yeah, so this is her first post-transplant biopsy. Um, it was performed about seven weeks after her transplant. And at low magnification, this kidney looks pristine. And at higher magnification by light microscopy, this kidney looked virtually pristine. The great majority of glomeruli were entirely normal and the tubules and interstitium were normal. There was certainly no evidence of rejection. And most of the gloms looked like this. However, a few looked like this, where I think this is some mesangial, some segmental mesangial hypercellularity. And I did find a rare glomerulus that looked like this with a little segmental endocapillary proliferative lesion. Um, immunofluorescence microscopy was performed on this case, which we don't always do on our transplants, but since there was a concern in this case for recurrent IgA, uh, we did IF, and here's how it looked. So there was um, mesangial IgA staining, which was graded at 2+, plus, um, along with some IgG and bright C3, um, all of the mesangial, really no capillary staining sphere. Um, we were finally able to actually perform electron microscopy, and that confirmed the presence of electron-dense immune complex deposits, which were predominantly in the mesangium and sort of mesangial waste. But every once in a while, you'd catch one that was out um, in a capillary loop um, always in the subendothelial distribution. So putting this together, um, this was diagnostic of recurrent IgA nephropathy, um, and it was a pretty uh, rapid recurrence. So given that her kidney function was normal, uh, it was only proteinuria and the biopsy findings. So we just increased her ACE inhibitor, which helped bring her proteinuria down, and she kind of went along okay, had been uh, doing fine when uh, we started noticing some BK uh, viremia in August uh, 2021, which was about three months post-transplant. So initially, uh, her MMF dose was decreased uh, based on uh, the rise in uh, BK uh, levels. However, uh, the viremia persisted and uh, she went up to a copy uh, load of 50,000. Uh, so we did another biopsy, which was five months post-transplant. And it looks like her creatinine had been creeping up at the same time. Right. Yeah, so here's her second transplant biopsy. This was now five months post-transplant. And once again, um, at low magnification, this kidney looks terrific. 
Um, however, at higher magnification, um, and, and we didn't, oh, and I should say, we did not see evidence of BK nephropathy in this biopsy. We did perform a uh, polyomavirus stain that was negative. We did not see interstitial inflammation or any viral cytopathic change. What we did see, however, was kind of an evolving glomerular lesion. So we saw um, a, a sort of a spectrum of um, mesangial um, hypercellularity and matrix expansion that ranged from kind of mild mesangial expansion in a glomerulus like this to um, many of the glomeruli in this case were sort of um, detached and in like a, a blood clot. So you can see several of them here. And you can appreciate, I think, that all of them have expanded uh, mesangium. Additionally, we found occasional areas of segmental endocapillary proliferation in this uh, biopsy. Um, and you can see what looks like it, if it were a little bit bigger, you might even start to call it a cellular crescent. As it is, I don't know that it occupies enough of kind of the, the radius of Bowman's capsule to really qualify. Um, and then here's a glomerulus that's involved by more segmental endocapillary proliferative uh, process. Um, in this case, it was sort of a limited sample, so we submitted all the tissue for light, so I don't have immunofluorescence or EM. But based on the previous biopsy, we felt, we felt comfortable saying that this was all consistent with recurrent IgA nephropathy, um, and that the main lesions here were the mesangial hypercellularity, which involved half of the glomeruli, and then segmental endocapillary proliferation in a minority of glomeruli. Um, no evidence of BK nephropathy. So this was a tricky situation to be in. Uh, she had a very high uh, PK uh, level of PK viremia, um, uh, and this uh, uh, recurrent IgA uh, uh, kind of persisted. Uh, we decided not to increase her immunosuppression and give her IVIG uh, uh, to try and uh, uh, see if uh, we could control BK uh, uh, with that. And that didn't seem to help uh, her uh, BK uh, viremia kept increasing. So we uh, made some uh, changes, uh, went down on her tacrolimus, uh, increased her prednisone from uh, 5 uh, milligrams per day to 10 milligrams per day uh, to uh, and trying to tackle both PK and IgA uh, simultaneously, but her creatinine kept uh, going uh, up. And then uh, in um, December, uh, she had a gross hematuria. Uh, her BK viremia was slightly lower at that time, but uh, she had gross hematuria and there was a sudden rise in creatinine to about three. So she underwent a third biopsy and this was now seven months post-transplant. Yeah, so in contrast to the previous transplant biopsy images that I've shown from this patient, uh, at this stage, um, she actually has a fair bit of interstitial inflammation and interstitial edema. That's a new development for her. Um, her glomeruli continued to show some of the changes that we saw in previous biopsies, particularly this mesangial expansion with increased cellularity and matrix. Um, however, the new finding now was the presence of cell cellular crescents in a significant number of glomeruli, and they looked somewhat like this. Um, overall, about a third of the glomeruli were now involved by cellular crescents. Um, and then you can see this, um, that there's some background interstitial inflammation. Oh, I guess I don't have good pictures of the interstitial inflammation. Um, we were able to do immunofluorescence on this biopsy, and we saw IgA dominant or IgA C3 co-dominant staining. And remember, in the remember, I showed you that um, immunofluorescence in the first biopsy that was exclusively in the mesangium. It's now in the mesangium, and it's also out in capillary loops, and that kind of goes along with the impression of uh, evolving crescentic um, glomerulonephritis. So, to compare her um, immunofluorescence from her early post-transplant biopsy and then this most recent post-transplant biopsy, you can see an evolution from this mesangial dep deposition pattern to a uh, more sort of mesangium plus capillary loop pattern. It's somewhat segmental, but uh, it was like this in all the glomeruli we looked at. EM was not terrific on this case because the glomeruli that we had were involved by cellular crescents, but I think you can appreciate that there is um, there, there are electron dense deposits. Uh, it's a little hard to tell where they are because everything's sort of collapsed, but uh, some of them seem to be sort of intramembranous. And in some places you get a sense that they're still subendothelial, but it's a little hard to say. At any rate, um, this was all consistent with recurrent IgA nephropathy, um, now with 33% cellular crescents. Um, I did a little bit of reading about recurrent IgA nephropathy post-transplant, and I'm just showing you this visual abstract from a recent publication um, in clinical JAS, and um, this is from uh, late 2021. Um, it's an, an international um, multi-center study 
looking at adult kidney transplant recipients. There's not as much work done on kids. And they found that up to like 23% of patients had recurrence of IgA in their graft kidney, but that was at 15 years and 20% at 10 years. So seeing it recur this rapidly, I think is unusual, but I'd really like to hear perspectives from other folks. And uh, Shana, I don't know, I, I, would, I would love to hear what you're doing with this patient now. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, things have not been easy with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, situation. Uh, in addition to BK and the uh, IgA uh, recurrence, um, our patient also was having uh, significant um, uh, psychological uh, issues with the, uh, just, you know, being diagnosed with end stage in the middle of the pandemic and uh, the steroids that she received for all of this. So uh, we knew we could not give her more uh, steroids for her uh, IgA. Uh, plus uh, for her, uh, that would have worsened her BK. So we just decided to kind of take it uh, slow and uh, not make a lot of changes. Uh, we switched her to uh, azathioprine uh, from uh, MMF and uh, she continues on uh, tacrolimus and prednisone. And uh, right now her creatinine is 1.5, 1.6. Her uh, UPC is about 1.6 uh, as well. And her BK uh, viremia is uh, down to, a, she was up to a log of log six, uh, 100,000 copies, and now she's uh, down to log two in the twos with uh, 800 to 1,000 copies. So seems to be holding steady. Um, I think uh, my colleague uh, Jody Smith had reached out to a couple of folks on the, on, uh, uh, the adult side to ask uh, what else could be done, and we decided to just uh, not make a lot of big dramatic changes for her. Yeah, so I think maybe we should go ahead and uh, just spend a couple of minutes um, discussing this case now, and then we can go on to the next ones. Um, the other two are shorter than this, so I think we have a few minutes to talk about this. I'm not, I don't think of transplant very much. Just looking at this visual abstract, DSA, did you check DSA? I mean, I, I don't even know how, is it just an association or there's potentially a pathogenetic relationship between DSA and uh, recurrence of IG and nephropathy? Yeah, we did, we, I mean, on the pediatric side, we actually check DSAs uh, pretty regularly uh, and uh, she has always been uh, negative. Uh, Has anyone else here seen IgA recurrence, like rapid IgA recurrence in a kidney graft? Um, hi, Robin, this is Azad. Yeah, I, I mean, we, for sure we had a, a few cases of uh, rapid recurrence of IgA nephropathy with similar pattern. I mean, the strong C3 and crescentic IgA. Crescentic IgA you know, can, can be more uh, severely recurring and earlier recurring, it seems like. It, uh, I have another question as well. I remember particularly the, um, you know, one of our cases that also had um, monoclonal gemopathy. Of course, that was in the adult. Um, um, was an adult case associated with a background uh, secondary C3 gemopathy to monoclonal gemopathy. So what about this case? Did you think about the background C3 gromalopathy, which might be aggravating the severity of IG nephropathy? Have you done any workup, any evidence for that? Wow, we did. That's... Oh, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead, Robin. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> we, we did think about C3 glomerulopathy, especially based on like her initial biopsy where and uh, like the uh, pre-transplant biopsies where there was a strong C3 uh, deposition, uh, but uh, she's never had a, a complement abnormality. Like we just checked uh, C3, C4. She did not have any abnormality there and we did not pursue uh, additional uh, workup. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you thought about that. Um, I, I wasn't the original diagnostic pathologist in that first biopsy. And so I, I think I came into this case with sort of the anchoring bias that this was IgA that just happened to have more C3 than usual. Um, but I'm glad to hear that there was a, a you know, a, a pursuit of the possible C3 nephropathy diagnosis.
Any other um, thoughts or comments on this case? A lot of comments in the chat, some comments in the chat. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think uh, we might consider doing more, a more extensive complement workup uh, for her. And we don't typically see monoclonal uh, gammopathies in uh, uh, this age group, but uh, definitely uh, given that, I mean, this is kind of, the entire picture is somewhat unusual for pediatrics. I think we, we can consider looking into that as well. Yeah, I suppose the, the, un the unusual nature of the presentation does kind of support the idea of maybe looking for unusual causes. It's, uh, you know, it, it, we, we always like, it, it, there, I think there's a tendency to look for the single unifying diagnosis, but it, it does make you wonder when it behaves in, in such an aberrant way like this. All right, should we uh, move on and talk about our next case? Dr. Simons will be presenting this case. Thanks, Robin, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to present our cases to you. This is an 18-year-old boy um, with Evans syndrome and some other medical problems who is noted to have a persistently elevated creatinine. So um, this uh, young man is 18 years old. He has a 22Q11.2 chromosomal deletion um, and some syndromic findings that are associated with that, which I'll mention in a moment. And he also happens to have Evans syndrome, which is an autoimmune cytopenia, which is not actually thought to be related to the chromosomal issue. He presented uh, with an acute illness. So he had fever and malaise, headache, and some diarrhea. This was uh, uh, about a year ago, and he uh, was checked for COVID and turned out to be COVID negative. And as part of his evaluation, his uh, creatinine was uh, noted to be 1.3 um, with a baseline of 0 0.7. So this is a young man who gets blood testing as part of his other um, follow-up with his hematology uh, team. And so we knew his creatinine was 0.7, uh, which should be a normal uh, GFR for this patient given his age and body habits. So 1.3 was clearly outside of normal for him. And the question was, in the setting of his acute illness, um, he had had a lot of problems with diarrhea. Was he just volume deplete? And the team who was taking care of him thought maybe he had a volume uh, related problems leading to acute kidney injury and that's why his creatinine was up. So he improved after about 10 days, although still having problems with some fatigue and still having diarrhea. And he had ongoing follow-up with his primary physician and also with the hematology team, uh, but they noticed that his creatinine stayed up uh, at around 1.1 to 1.3. And with this persistent elevation over about two months, they finally gave us a call and he came to see us in consultation and saw one of my colleagues. Next slide, Robin. So um, just for a little bit of background, the 22Q11 chromosomal deletion syndrome can have lots of different clinical uh, presentations. Um, it's associated with what we see in children as the velocardiofacial syndrome with very characteristic facies, certain problems with cardiac defects, um, some other problems. It can also be associated with the DeGeorge syndrome or DeGeorge-like presentation in this patient. He had um, an ASD and a PDA, which was noted when he was an infant. He had uh, developmental problems, which are also very, very common. And he had um, findings of autism and ADHD. And it turned out he also had hypogammaglobulinemia. And there was some question as to whether or not that immune-related process is um, associated with uh, 22Q11 deletion, which can have immune disorders, or if this was a separate process. Now, his Evans syndrome was felt to be something slightly different. Um, and he had thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, and low Ig levels associated with the Evans syndrome. That hematological uh, constellation goes along with the Evans syndrome. Um, he often required transfusions and prednisone therapy. Um, he had had IVIG in the past, but had bad reactions to it. So they tried to avoid using it. Unfortunately, his Ig levels were not that low. He had history of um, epistaxis at intervals because of his thrombocytopenia. And he had been admitted um, the prior year with fever and cough um, and had some infiltrates on his CT scan, uh, but then he seemed to sort of get better after a negative workup um, and um, no further uh, issues were pursued at that point. So that's his past medical history leading up to this. Next slide, please. Um, he didn't have significant past kidney concerns. He'd had dark urine once when he had a hemolytic event, but nothing else. He didn't have dysuria, frequency, urgency, et cetera. There was no edema and no high blood pressure associated with the current status. Um, he was on some cetirizine and sertraline and acetaminophen, but of note, did not report a history of taking non-steroidals. Again, he came to see um, our team about two months after his acute illness. 
No more fevers, although still feeling fatigue, creatinine running 1.1 to 1.3, and cystatin C's anywhere between 1.4 and 2.2 within this same range of time. His calcium levels were a little high at 11 to 12 total. PTH was actually low at four, and his uric acid was noted to be 11.9, but all the rest of his chemistry evaluations were normal. He underwent a renal ultrasound, which showed a normal kidney. The pyramids appeared to be a little bit echogenic, but there was no hydronephrosis. And there was this incidental finding on the um, ultrasound of a 3.5 centimeter node um, near the port of hepatis, but he did not have any adenopathy on physical examination. His urine testing showed his urinalysis to have a 10-10 uh, gravity, pH of six, no protein and no heme, and really nothing Thing very exciting on his microscopy, although the urine was sent for eosinophils and the eosinophil test came back as positive. We screened his beta 2 microglobulin and that was thought to be within the normal range. Um, his urine calcium to creatinine ratio was low, so not an elevated calcium creatinine ratio, and his uric acid per GFR was also in the normal range, not suggesting high levels of uric acid in the urine. Next slide, please. So we had a patient with that clinical history and uh, creatinine that didn't seem to want to come down by itself. And so this young man underwent a biopsy. Yeah, so this biopsy was unfortunately, or uh, maybe it was okay. It was predominantly medulla. And the most striking finding that we saw on the biopsy were these uh, numerous areas of coarse dystrophic calcification within the interstitium. So you can see a lot of it here. Uh, and it was also present in the renal cortex in areas like this. Um, unfortunately, this biopsy uh, was really limited in terms of the number of glomeruli that were present. So in the tissue submitted for light microscopy, we had a maximum of five glomeruli. And when we pulled all of our materials submitted for immunofluorescence, EM, and light microscopy, we had a total of 13 glomeruli to look at. So what you're seeing here is actually the HE stain cryostat section from immunofluorescence. That said, however, among the glomeruli that we had to look at, they looked normal. Um, so the only, uh, the only significant uh, finding um, was the presence of these coarse interstitial calcifications. Um, here's a PAS image of one of the few glomeruli in the microscopic material. Um, the other thing that I sort of picked up as I was reviewing this material in preparation for this conference is um, kind of funny looking arteries. And I'm not sure what to make of this. And I don't know that it has anything to do do with um, his underlying disease, but I was struck by the fact that these two different arteries both seem to have um, some intimal expansion and fibrosis. And if I were seeing this in a graft kidney, I would be considering sort of a, a you know, a, a chronic like intimal, um, uh, arterial intimal fibrosis kind of diagnosis. So that was sort of peculiar. I'm not sure what to make of it. Um, at any rate, um, putting this together, um, the diagnosis that we were able to give on this kidney was nephrocalcinosis. Um, it was a limited sample, but we did not see glomerular abnormality in the material we had. And now I wonder whether there was some sort of arteriopathy, but I'm not sure what to make of that. I'll bounce it back to you now, Jordan. All right. Thanks, Robin. And um, we were um, confused, and this unfortunately was not as um, um, enlightening as we were really hoping it would be, but there was some ongoing clinical questions that some of our other colleagues were um, looking to answer as well. There may be another slide with description, but if not, I'll tell you what's going on, which is that yeah. it's okay that um, the um, patient's creatinine stayed um, at around 1 to 1.1, so slightly better than the peak of 1.3. But also on screening laboratory tests, his calcium remained elevated, and the PTH also was suppressed for this patient. He had a PTHRP scent, which was um, low, um, and had uh, vitamin D levels sent, and his 25-hydroxy-D was 20 nanograms per milliliter, but the 125 was elevated at 75 micrograms per mil with a reference in our lab between 18 and 64. And you may recall that he also had the finding of the um, uh, lymph node on ultrasound. And our colleagues um, um, in uh, hematology decided that that certainly needed to be reviewed. And he went for further um, imaging testing. So this patient underwent a CT scan. 
And the CT scan, um, which was done of his chest and his abdomen, demonstrated diffuse lymphadenopathy in the chest and in the abdomen and the pelvis. Um, and there were also some um, opacities that were noted in the lung, um, similar to some extent to the findings that had been seen the previous year when he had what was concerning perhaps for an acute pneumonia, but then seemed to get better. better. He also had hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. And the differential diagnosis from our radiology colleagues was for lymphoma versus sarcoidosis. And um, given those questions um, on the uh, findings, he underwent another diagnostic study. Yeah, so um, they, I think they went to, they went to biopsy a readily available lymph node and ended up giving us a right axillary lymph node. And on biopsy, it looked like this. Um, so you can see that there's some, um, there's some, there's a partially preserved um, structure, lymph node structure here where you can see a germinal center here. But you can see that some of the architecture is effaced by this proliferation of um, pink cells, which, if you look more closely, resolve themselves into granulomatous inflammation. And in some areas, this granulomatous inflammation had central areas of uh, caseating necrosis. Um, in other areas, it was non necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. Um, there were some multinucleated giant cells. Um, we looked, and uh, I was really hoping to find an asteroid body here. I've never seen one in the wild, but there were no asteroid bodies. There were no Schaumann bodies, um, but there was this granulomatous inflammation um, that in um, a, a few foci actually extended out into the extranodal um, connective tissue. So you can see some granulomatous inflammation here out in the fat. Um, we did a infectious workup on this. So we did AFB stains and we did um, fungal stains, which came back negative. And so we were left with a diagnosis of granulomatous lymphadenitis. And putting together the clinical picture, um, the, the, the central necrosis in these granulomas gave us some pause because typically, like classically, sarcoidosis is non necrotizing granulomatous inflammation, but it can have central necrosis. And it seemed as though, with the negative infectious uh, workup that we did um, and with the, um, the clinical picture, that this was all. Um, entirely supportive of sarcoidosis. So I, I think that, that I think this is all entirely consistent with sarcoidosis, even if the even if the necrotizing inflammation is a little bit unusual. So um, I read up a little bit about kidney disease in sarcoidosis because it's not a diagnosis we make very often in pediatric world. Um, and uh, the most common manifestations of kidney disease in sarcoidosis come from abnormal calcium metabolism um, and um, the most common things that you see are you can see nephrocalcinosis in about 5% of patients, um, as we did in this patient. Um, you can also see nephrolithiasis. Um, the numbers I saw on this were a fairly wide range, 1 to 14% of patients. Um, if you biopsy all comers in sarcoidosis, you, you find interstitial nephritis, sometimes granulomatous, in about 20%, but many of them are subclinical. So um, many patients with sarcoidosis may have this and not have any manifestation in terms of lab, lab, laboratory abnormalities. And then there's rare case reports of glomerular lesions. Um, it's a wide spectrum of uncommon glomerular things, membranous, IgA, minimal change, a few other things. Um, but uh, the most common things, see, the most common lesion seems to be this interstitial nephritis, and the most common thing that causes renal functional problems seems to be related to um, the abnormal calcium metabolism. Send it back to you, Jordan. Thank you, Robin. So um, this young man um, um, uh, quickly got uh, hooked up with our colleagues in uh, rheumatology and uh, has been with the immunologist. He's been receiving therapy with prednisone, which he's uh, received in the past related to his Evans syndrome. Again, he doesn't seem to do well with IV IG, but he's getting subcutaneous IG and seems to respond fairly well to that, not having the allergic reactions he's had before, and is also um, receiving therapy with methotrexate. I reviewed the last set of notes from rheumatology and immunology, and they feel that he's doing very well. His clinical status overall has improved. His fatigue is much better. He's not had problems with joint discomfort, and his creatinine now is between 0 0.9 and 1. And that's kind of where we are with him at this point. A couple of questions in the chat, Robin. I'll let you take a look. Uh, let me pull the chat. All right, let's see. Um, did we do molecular testing for microbes? No, um, I'm pretty sure we did not. Um, we did stains, and I don't know what other infectious workup he had. Do you know? 
No, I don't. And I think that uh, the thought was that that was not likely part of the clinical presentation, but yeah, good question. Yeah. Right. Could I just follow that up? But when the lymph node biopsy was done, um, had the patient been on antibiotics prior to that biopsy? I don't believe so, Kelly. I don't think so. Because I don't think he had like clinical like symptoms that would have prompted antibiotic therapy. Okay, like, not the lung nodules or the opacities. Those are. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look to be certain. Okay. Yeah, and I'm just it, still wondering if there's some suppression potentially of you know our ability to detect a microbe, um, which mm -hmm. still could make us a you know an infection that's um, eluding us. And the the stains that we do typically to try to pick up a microbe are not <laughs> yeah. really very helpful. Not the most sensitive. Yeah, and I would have to go back and remind myself of whether we sent material to microbiology from this biopsy. Um, although I think the main clinical concern was lymphoma versus sarcoid, so we may not have. Um, and my suspicion is that at some point he got a quantifiron, but I do not know that for a fact. I don't want to interrupt my slideshow here to go digging through his medical record in the middle of the conference, but. Um, yeah, I'll go back and look, because, um, yeah, it, you, you, I mean, the thing about sarcoid is it's a diagnosis of exclusion, right? Um, you see granulomatous inflammation, you do what you can to rule out infectious etiologies, and then you say, okay, we didn't find anything, the picture fits, we think it's sarcoid. It's, it, it, it's not a, uh, there, there's not a single definitive, like, gold standard test for it. So I, I am hopeful that our rheumatology folks are, you know, familiar with the, the workup and have, have done that infectious workup, but I, I can't say with certainty for this patient that it was all that. What else? Any experience with uh, renal disease and sarcoidosis from our uh, colleagues over at the U? It's an unusual one for us, for sure. Um, I do have one patient, actually, who uh, um, presumed to have sarcoidosis based on cardiac abnormalities, um, who presented with hypokalemia, uh, actually normal creatinine, uh, but, you know, 24-hour urine, everything is suggesting a lot of potassium and sodium wasting. Um, and uh, there's also hypercalciuria, even though they have normal serum calcium. Uh, I haven't, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, uh, without much protein or, or a normal GFR, uh, it's hard to really pursue a biopsy. But, um, you know, that, that was someone that I was considering that there might be tubular uh, abnormalities secondary to sarcoid, um, if she really does have sarcoid. So. Uh, that's kind of a more unusual presentation I've encountered in my clinic. Yeah, I mean, that, that picture sounds like kind of a tubular interstitial disease story, doesn't it? That's we, interesting. We do have a sarcoid clinic here at, uh, at Montlake, uh, which Ganesh Raghu runs. Um, and I suppose not infrequently we get sent patients uh, to nephrology clinic. Uh, most of them get recurrent episodes of acute kidney injury associated with hypercalcemia. So they have an underlying interstitial nephritis um, and they just get recurrent episodes, which are often steroid responsive. Do you think they respond to steroids because there's, uh, because the steroids um, decrease the hypercalcemia? Yeah, I think the ones we biopsy, they, they often have an interstitial nephritis underlying it as well. So it's always a little hard to know whether whether how much of it is the hypercalcemia component and how much of it is the interstitial nephritis component. Oh, but sure, they, but, yeah. But, but they typically go together. So their, uh -huh. their kidney function increases, their calcium increases, they get steroids, and, uh, and both of them usually improve. Interesting. 
with my patient, it's a bit of a challenge because uh, she's not hypercalcemic. Uh, she hasn't been, but she is consistently hypercalciuric. Um, you know, and I do worry about her developing nephrocalcinosis, but uh, again, it's, it's one of these weird situations because it's hard to recommend, pre uh, I mean, she's already on a low dose of prednisone, but it's kind of hard to say whether to, to up her dose uh, and kind of treat more aggressively for hypercalciuria alone. Um, uh, it's just interesting to me because kind of different presentations. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, should we do our last case? Uh, the last case is gonna be presented by Dr. Mushi. Uh, hi, welcome uh, and thank you everyone. Uh, for letting me present and uh, please interrupt me with any questions that you have along the way. Uh, so this is a 16 year old uh, female uh, who is uh, now five years uh, post kidney transplant uh, with rising creatinine. So I first met the, the family um, when she was eight years of age. Uh, she was diagnosed with congenital nephrotic syndrome uh, initially in Mexico. And part of family history is her younger sister also uh, has congenital nephrotic syndrome and also has received a, a kidney transplant. Um, when they came to us, they were both maintained on peritoneal dialysis. Um, and uh, our patient here uh, was already anuric uh, when they came to us, uh, had significant uh, stigmas of, of uh uh, end stage kidney disease, uh, specifically the renal osteodystrophy was already wheelchair bound. Uh, as far as her clinical presentation in Mexico, she had nephrotic syndrome, uh, she was initiated, eventually went to end stage and started dialysis uh, prior to her second birthday uh, and did not have any native nephrotians. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get her uh, kidney transplant in April 2015. Uh, she did have a right natal nephrectomy at that time. Uh, her particular course uh, was really been significant for numerous infection, uh, recurrent pneumonias, uh, recurrent polynephritis, and known to have um, reflux into the, the transplanted uh, kidney. Uh, early on, three months uh, surveillance biopsy uh, was consistent with calcium inhibitor toxicity. Uh, and so at that time, we had uh, transitioned her from tacrolimus to serolimus. Um, but at the, the one year surveillance biopsy, um, the biopsy was consistent with subclinical rejection. Her creatinines were fairly stable. Uh, but she also was noted to have positive donor specific antibodies uh, circulating uh, eight months post transplant. Um, nothing on the on the biopsy as far as the C4D staining. Uh, she did receive rituximab and IVIG, uh, and um, so over time started developing um, more significant proteinuria. Uh, concern for transplant glomerulopathy, but given the fact uh, that uh, association of proteinuria and mTOR inhibitors, we decided to change it back to uh, tacrolimus to to take that out of the, the picture. So had um, uh, creatinine was around 1.2 to 1.4, uh, despite the rituximab and IVIG had persistence of her donor specific antibodies and her persistence uh, and slightly worsening of her proteinuria. Uh, and so the biopsy was performed uh, in this setting. And this is the, the graph of her creatinine. Um, really great in the beginning, but then slow, slow trend up and uh, around the first uh, biopsy that we're presenting now. So you previously has had a surveillance biopsies as noted before. I feel as though this, uh, the y-axis on this uh, graph is a little bit of dramatic foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Um, so she had several previous transplant biopsies, but I'm going to start by showing you her transplant biopsy at the time that uh, that, that we're discussing here, uh, when she uh, had this persistent uh, proteinuria and persistent DSA. So at this point, um, we're now 5.5 years out from transplant, and at low magnification, you can see that there's some kind of diffuse interstitial fibrosis 
there's some patchy tubular atrophy um, and the glomeruli at this magnification don't look too terrible. However, looking more closely, um, there's a lot of glomerular basement membrane alterations at this, in this biopsy. So you can see abundant um, double contours of glomerular basement membranes. Um, you can see areas that look as though perhaps there's some um, like capillary aneurysm formation. Um, I don't know quite what's going on in, in this area here, um, whether that's like a little bit of endothelial proliferation or whether that's some um, mesangiolysis. And you also get a sense of maybe some circulating inflammatory cells and sort of plump prominent endothelial cells here. Um, here, there's a pretty clear uh, capillary microaneurysm um, and some mesangiolysis. Um, and again, you can see abundant basement membrane alterations in this glomerulus. Uh, and in some, there was significant glomerulitis. So here's an example of some, uh, of some pretty good glomerulitis, um, as, well, as well as peritubular capillaritis. Um, despite the glomerular and peritubular capillary inflammation, however, um, C4D stain was negative and I think has always been negative in her biopsies. Um, other striking findings in this biopsy included um, some arteriolar changes that are really well visualized in this glomerulus where you can get this kind of sense of like sort of an onion skinning to the, uh, to the arteriole as it enters the glomerulus. Um, and again, you can see double contours here, um, as well as a little bit of segmental uh, sclerosis, I think. Um, and um, occasionally areas of more um, florid segmental sclerosis, um, in this case with some sort of prominent visceral epithelial cells and another capillary microaneurysm. Um, we did immunofluorescence and EM on this case. Um, immunofluorescence um, did not show any specific staining to suggest immune complex deposition. Unfortunately, electron microscopy in this case did not have glomeruli. So this was signed out as diffuse basement membrane duplication with focal microaneurysms, um, moderate capillaritis and glomerulitis, but C4D negative. Um, and then there was arterial intimal fibrosis, which I did not show you. Um, and this arteriolar sclerosis is what it was called. So when I was putting together this conference, I, I got curious. This was taken, this biopsy was five years out. The most pr recent previous biopsy had been um, at about one year post-transplant. And I wondered whether there had been any changes there that we might be able to see retrospectively, even if they weren't picked up at the time. Um, so I went back and I looked at that biopsy from 2016, which was one year, eight months post-transplant. Most of it looked entirely normal. But I found both in the microscopic description and um, present on the slides, rare foci of double contours. Um, so here there's a little bit of glomerulitis in this glomerulus. And I think there's some, there's some subtle double contours in areas like this, um, kind of segmental basement membrane alterations. Um, and after getting into a staring contest with the Jones on high magnification, I think I found some pretty uh, good double contours. Not very many, but I think that they are present even one year, eight months out, so even four years prior prior to this biopsy. Um, so we um, decided to give her more rituximab and IVIG, um, given a clapolaritis, even though the C4D staining was, was negative. Um, but then over time, she, she started to develop significant uh, hypertension, um, amazingly asymptomatic, like systolics in, in the 200s uh, and was, on five antihypertensive uh, medications, um, and so quite refractory. Um, at that time, we, we also sent for non-HLA donor specific antibodies and uh, came back positive for the angiotensin II type one receptor antibody. Her chronic kidney disease started to progress more, more rapidly, uh, and due to the refractory hypertension, we, um, we were hoping that her uh, solitary native kidney was uh, was driving some of this this process, and we decided to move towards a, a native nephrectomy. Yeah, I took out the slides from the native nephrectomy, um, but basically they they showed end stage kidney with atrophic tubules, um, really hard to find glomeruli, honestly, and then very thickened arteries. Uh, so. Um, it, we were hoping that her, her hypertension would improve significantly. Uh, it did not, uh, it did improve and she's no longer completely refractory to antihypertensives. She is now mostly controlled, uh, still on four to five antihypertensives. And so some improvement uh, from, from previous 
And as you can see, her, uh, her CKD progressed, progression was much more rapid uh, during that time and had a second biopsy when we had the, uh, the peak to about 4.5, 4.7. Yeah, so here's that second biopsy. This was about a year after the biopsy that I showed previously. And um, as before, you can see that there's this kind of diffuse interstitial fibrosis with patchy areas of tubular atrophy. Um, and you also get a sense that some of the kidneys are involved by segmental sclerosis, segmentally sclerosing lesions. You can also see some of that um, arterial intimal fibrosis that I referred to before. Um, there was an area of cortical scar in this, which may have kind of skewed our numbers in terms of uh, global glomerular sclerosis. Um, and I don't know how significant that is, but there were areas with significant uh, scarring and global glomerular sclerosis. In areas where glomeruli were preserved, we continued to see significant basement membrane alterations that I think are more apparent now than they were before with abundant uh, double contours, pretty much involving all the glomeruli now. Um, however, in contrast to the previous biopsy, I think there was less glomerulitis than before. Um, and as before, you can see areas of capillary aneurysm formation. Um, there's some sort of hyaline deposition in some of these. Um, and then here's another area with a capillary uh, microaneurysm and I think some mesangiolysis. And as I referred to earlier, there are areas of uh, segmental sclerosis, which I think is uh, a secondary process here. So this was called uh, mild glomerulitis, um, still with negative C4D. But now that we know that she's got that anti-angiotensin um, 2 receptor antibody, um, that all kind of fits together. That can be associated with um, sort of features of antibody, C4D negative sort of antibody-mediated rejection. Um, she continued to have um, what I called severe transplant glomerulopathy with mesangiolysis, um, but now had segmentally sclerosed glomeruli um, and had more extensive interstitial fibrosis and global GS, although perhaps some of that was just hitting in the area of cortical scar. So how has she progressed since then? Uh, as the, the graph sort of shows, uh, you know, her chronic kidney disease has continued to progress. She is uh, nearing needing transition um, back to uh, dialysis. Um, and I would love the, uh, the um, the group's thoughts and the transplant experts' uh, thoughts about, you know, given that the angiotensin 2 receptor antibody was sort of presented, like, uh, it, you know, what do we do uh, prior to the working up, prior to the second transplant to give her a better course? You know, what are her, if, if she were to get a second uh, transplant, what are her prospects for having a, a course similar to this versus something different? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, and from, from what I gather, there wasn't a lot of literature of the, the non-HLA antibodies and, and therapies we had sort of looked into when that was detected of, you know, we should even consider um, paresis, but didn't seem to be much, much benefit. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm relying on our, our transplant experts here to just consider that. Um, she's also, um, you know, and her sister has sort of sailed and, and has done quite well. And so even though same sort of disease, same family, uh, the course has been completely different for, for both of them. Well, just a slightly separate question, but yeah. does she have congenital nephrotic syndrome of the Finnish type? And although she didn't develop marked nephrotic syndrome, do you, do you look for anti-nephron antibodies in these patients? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, initially um, we didn't send a, a genetic uh, workup because he was already uh, in New York and we didn't think it would change our management. Uh, there was no history of other markers like placenta megaly during the, the pregnancy that can be associated with the, with the Finnish type. Um, but we did not send antinephrine antibodies. And, uh, so I think definitely prior to, prior to the next transplant, definitely much more extensive workup uh, for her. I don't know the answer to this, but would you expect to see um, immunofluorescence, um, like immune complex deposition in the setting of antinephrine antibodies? I know you can get it like after um, transplantation for Alfort syndrome, you can get like an anti-GBM, but I don't, I don't know about Finnish type. Uh, I don't think so. Um, okay. 
Yeah. Because we did do immunofluorescence on one of these and did not see anything for what that's worth. Yeah, I think the the anti the anti nephron antibodies that have been described in minimal change disease sometimes the IF is very um, very subtle. <laughs> so uh, all right. I think you have to look hard for it sometimes. Yeah. Might have been too subtle for us then. Yeah. And Jordan, to your question, we, we have not screened the, the sister um, for for the antibody. Um, it'd be interesting, but C has done, you know, knock on wood, uh, really well. Um, C is now, uh, C got transplanted about a, a year and a half after, and C still maintains her, her creatinine at her baseline post-transplant at around 0.5. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have uh, helpful experiences or I see a couple of comments in the chat. Ah, um, uh, Dr. Leka says there is no reliable anti-ATR testing and really putting very weight on it since present in 80% of our LD controls. Is that right? 80% of people have anti-angiotensin um, 2 receptors, receptor antibodies? Whoa. Okay. That would complicate things. I suppose it could be one where the titer matters or just the clinical context. All right. Um, well, if anyone has um, thoughts offline that they'd like to uh, communicate, you can get in touch with me directly or with Dr. Uh, Munshi. Um, I think you're raj.munshi at seattlechildrens.org. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's all we've got for today. Um, Great. So I will. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Robin, and, and to um, the three uh, nephrologists who presented. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here this morning and hope everyone has a good weekend. We'll return next Friday. Thank you thanks very so. much.